ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, quite a show here for you today on the Kurzweil podcast. Uh, we have Trisha Long from Vestas. Hello. Now, hi, Trisha. Thanks for coming on. Um, I, I want to give some contacts to Vestas, and then obviously you're going to be able to expand upon this. Um, for the two people in the entire world that don't know who Vestas is, they're a wind turbine manufacturer now branching off into a thousand different aspects of wind energy. Trish is going to tell us all about it. Um, they've been around for 110 years. They're striving to be the global leader in sustainable energy solutions. Um, in February of 2019 this year, I saw a wind power engineering article that mentioned in 2018 they had installed over 10 gigawatts of onshore wind energy, had a market share of over 22% globally. This year, they actually passed the 100 gigawatt um, of energy installed with a mid-American project in Iowa. Vestas is going bananas with their growth. And Trisha, I'd like to cover all of the different aspects of not only your story, but the history of Vestas and how you guys have evolved to be this monster player in the wind energy sector. Uh, but firstly, thank you for coming on. Yes, thanks for having me. So why don't we start first with um, your history, and then we'll kind of transform the conversation into Vestas as a whole. Um, I did some research. I have some Sherlock Holmes in the background that <laughs> checked out your LinkedIn profile. You started at EDF, then yes. you were at Upwind, correct? Right. Which was then, uh, I believe, acquired by Vestas. Can you walk me through your natural progression through wind energy from the introduction to where you are today? Definitely. And even before pre um, EDF, I was at a utility as an intern. Um, I kind of grew up loving just being interested in energy. And so I had been an energy club in college and did my internships and really wanted to move to San Diego. Um, and after my really cool internship at the utility, I did have a feeling I wanted to go in the renewable direction. It was kind of the exciting, hot new area. Um, whereas what I had done in my internship was coal and natural gas, which is super cool in its own way, but you could tell um, where people were, what people were excited to talk about. Mm -hmm. So decided to move to San Diego, started looking up companies, um, ran into EDF and got an internship at EDF with resource assessment, which has a lot to do with meteorology and putting out met towers and sensors and before the turbines are up it's almost totally different than what i'm doing right now which is aftermarket part sales totally once the turbine's been up for a while so kind of got like a little taste of wind energy at edf and what happens before the turbines go up and then got to um network in san diego and I got to meet a good friend of mine, Carrie, through Rise, which at the time was Wowie. And so San Diego has a great Rise community. We networked, we met more people, and ended up at Upwind Solutions, which was a lot smaller, kind of felt more like a startup vibe than EDF, which excited me. And I learned that I was gonna start going back into warehousing and forecasting and all these things that I had learned in college. So really really excited to get started like with my real uh bread and butter that i had learned and about three weeks after i joined upwind it was announced that we had been bought by vestas so, <laughs> <Wow. laughs> so that was really funny because i was like startup vibes and like all ready to do startup stuff and then i was like oh by the way you're you're now part of the biggest wind company in the world. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So it was not what I expected at all, but um, amazing, like such a fun transition to get to go from two totally different wind companies, really three totally different wind companies and learn the ropes, get the super quick wind 101 and um, start meeting people and learning what we could do to make the turbines run better and have better availability. Oh, that's, that's really neat. It's funny. You're excited about the startup. You get acquired by the largest wind turbine manufacturer in the world. I'd be curious to hear what the, the differences were between upwind and then that natural progression into, you know, getting into Vestas. Did things really change from an operation standpoint? Did you go from all these different hats that you had to wear to a more specific niche side of Vestas? 
what did that transition look like for you? Yeah, we, I felt like when I had moved into Vestas, what I had done it Upwind had been four different departments at Vestas. So what one person was doing at Upwind. Um, and that was kind of cool because I got to share my like top level knowledge of a bunch of different things with lots of people in Vestas and kind of like retell my story about how we kept a really lean supply chain. We didn't stock a lot of stuff. We would source on our toes and look things up really fast and work with our vendors to get to get parts really quickly and then ship them directly to our customers so that they wouldn't have long lead times and that gave us an advantage um, and then on the flip side i got to learn all about what it's like working for such a big company um, the reliability requirements how they have warehouses around the globe um, all the cool resources we get like we have um, you know, an O&M building at every site in the U.S. and there's parts in there. And so why ship something from the centralized warehouse if we maybe have one down the street at a Vesta service site? Um, so it was totally different, but it was a great chance to bring in new ideas. And I think that's why Vestas, um, that's how Vestas keeps growing is they are willing to kind of open their ears, learn from Vestas from Upwind, learn from Avalon into those two new markets when they purchased both of us at about the same time and help them grow. That was really neat. Could, could you talk fun. about kind of the, the parts distribution and warehousing and the current overview of how Vestas likes to operate um, just as a, as a company for all the different wind sites that you service? Yeah, we have, so our main warehousing is in Europe. So, um, we pull lots of parts into Europe and distribute them globally, but we are evolving to localize more and more components. I think almost all industries are doing that because why ship it yourself if your vendor's willing to do it for you for cheaper? And also why ship it at all if they're making it in the US? That's even better. So in the US right now, we have one main warehouse in Houston. It used to be in Denver. And we moved because we think it's a better location and we have a new um, kind of setup to help distribute the parts to all of our wind farms. But we do still have factories in Colorado. So that's where we make our new wind turbines in the US. And the Houston warehouse has been really cool for saving time, um, especially components coming from Europe can come into the Houston port, which they have always done. But now they can go to the Houston warehouse and get to you versus driving to Denver and getting to you. <laughs> oh, that's really, could you talk about maybe the global distribution of parts? I think a lot of people overlook because we're so focused on the growth of wind in the US, but it is growing across the entire country. I saw in one of your press releases, for example, you have the first product uh, project, this is Vestas in El Salvador. So how do you guys organize parts and getting these different sites exactly what they need on a global scale? Um, can you yeah. talk a little bit more in depth about that? Yeah, um, I think it's just a mind blowing amount of negotiations with our vendors and also all the data that we've collected about what each site needs. We feel like we really know what a V100 site in the world needs. And then we know specifically in the US what those turbines are going to need, which might be different, a little bit different in the whole world. And then maybe on an island or on in the middle of Texas are going to have two different amount of stocking needs because of proximity to other sites. And so this crazy amount of data that we've collected has let us get really smart about stocking. And so also on top of our relationship with our vendors and our willingness to work as a global combined supply chain, I'm reaching out to people in Denmark, I'm reaching out to people in other areas to see where we can get our parts. That is, um, that's fascinating. Obviously, it's above my pay grade. I'm just kind of the podcast guy here at Curse, So <laughs> I don't understand global supply chain like Vestas would by any means. Um, but I'd be curious to hear some of the differences between maybe climates. Um, are you finding a V100 site, for instance, in Costa Rica is going to require different parts, different parts are going to fail more frequently than a site in, let's say, northern Minnesota? Um, do you guys have that sort of data and can you share some of the differences that you've seen in just aggregating all that data from different sites? Yeah, we we know that that 
is the case, but I don't personally, I'm not a, an engineer, so I don't, or I'm not a, a mechanical engineer, so I can't give any specific examples, but that is, that's why we're doing it. That's why we're collecting the data. And that's why when we, um, when we think about a new wind farm that's being built in the lifetime of the components and we can predict how many of whatever component that person's gonna need, we can just make those big purchases ahead of time to make sure that we have it on stock as, as often as possible. That is really cool. And you mentioned predict. Um, do you have much to do with predictive maintenance and all these different tools and technology, the internet of things per se, um, that a lot of these sites are starting to implement and, and adopt? Um, and have you guys been able to experiment at all with that for like gearboxes or generators where you can actually see you know, a percentage of life left, what's prone to fail, what's going on within those main components. Can you speak at all on that? I do know that we have two tools that we're working on right now that help with predictive maintenance. And those would be Vestas Online, which is a service for our service sites to help them um, have transparency into what we think they need. And also Utopus, which is more of like a data and predictive um, maintenance schedule software. That is so neat. And then let's so, talk so about online. On yeah. Well, yes. Well, we could talk and at the end of this call. I definitely want to talk about the future of Vestas and the, the goal. But one of the coolest projects that I've been able to see you guys basically start with and run with it and ultimately grow it to something astronomical is Shop Vestas. I believe I saw 65 countries serviced, maybe more. 30,000 plus spare parts all on an online e-commerce website. Could you talk to me just about Shop Vestas as a whole um, and maybe even just the growth of the idea to what it is today? Yeah. Yeah. I. It's funny that um, some, some of the podcast listeners might remember our site before Shop Vestas that was kind of like add these components to your cart but it's going to go over email and it's not really a web shop and it's just crazy how simple we were even six seven years ago almost everything's over email that's something that blew my mind coming into the industry is that we order things over email and just wait for it to come basically and don't have any transparency into what the person that's sending us the material has like we do when we're on amazon where we can see going to be shipped in three days and here's your tracking number once it goes so shop Vestas, that's my favorite thing about shop Vestas is the transparency it's going to give the customer all the data about when their stuff's going to come and instead of an email with a po an email with a requested delivery date and another email with the um, tracking request it's just on the website whenever you want to see it could you walk me through the transaction process, maybe for one of your customers, a Vestas site, looking to order directly from you guys? What is it like for them to go from, okay, I need this part, to getting a part in from Shop Vestas um, in hand and installing the turbine? Walk me through that whole process if you could. For sure. We um, have, like you said, 30,000 parts on the website. That's not every single part the Vestas carries. Um, so that's, you know, that's how many components there are. But the way we've been trying to do it is we've started off with as many parts as we could that are regularly purchased with a drawing, the part number, and some extra information that we could pull out of our system, like the weights and the dims. And as we've gone on, we've been able to take real photos instead of line drawings. We've been able to add pricing components. We've been able to add details um like descriptions about the part and at this point it's really searchable by description like if you know what you're looking for you can either dive down by turbine or you can just type what you're searching for and find it but everything is searchable by vestas part number and that's gonna let um instead of somebody kind of describing to me what they're looking for over email and in best case sending me a picture that's gonna let people just shop like is the natural shopping cart online and figure out what they need. And if there's three different colors because it's an outside component and you want to match your paint, or if it's two different Hertz and you want to make sure you don't buy the European version instead of the United States version, um, it's all on the website and you're not going to 
you're going to know what you need and there's not going to be mistakes. And so when somebody's on the website, let's say I'm looking for, I think I saw a blower fan on the uh, shop best featured products when I was checking it out earlier today. I'm looking for this particular fan motor. I find it, I put it in my cart. Is there any other additional information that the customer is receiving, like lead times, where it's stocked? I'd like to know all the pertinent details because I think a lot of our um, listeners here would want to know how to streamline their ordering process and not have to go through email, you know, request for quote PR, then a PO, then all the different steps that you already laid out for us. So walk me through how you've been able to con consolidate that into one easy transaction online. Totally. On the, on the site, you're going to be able to see your lead time. And right now we have a stock indication that is, we have it in stock green, um, yellow, low stock. That's low stock considering the whole United States is demand. So, and Canada does demand. So what might be low stock for one part could be three components. And what's low stock for tubes of Kluber is still, you know, 2000 tubes left on the shelf. Um, and then once and then once it's out of stock it'll either say basically replenishing I mean we're it's on its way and it'll tell you the lead time or out of stock and you're gonna have to ask us to investigate it with our supply chain um, and that's when we can do our voodoo and really dig in and see where we can get a <laughs> component in the whole world um, in the back end and then you can so say there's 2,000 tubes of Kluber on the site, but you wanted 3,000, it'll let you know, we can send you 2,000 right now, and the rest are gonna come on this date. And on the website, as things change, like say we did get our shipment in early, everything's gonna update live. So we get our shipment early, you're gonna see a new delivery date. The day it ships, you're gonna see the tracking and that's gonna update that it's been shipped and here's your FedEx number. Um, so it's really live, which is, which is great. And it's almost even faster than me going into SAP and finding the right transaction and doing it. Sometimes it's faster to go on the website. <laughs> That's incredible. So obviously uh, things don't always work out perfectly. I don't want to make any assumptions here, but there had to have been challenges that you ran into pulling all this live data together onto an e-commerce site. Can you tell me a little bit about like the process of rolling out the old website and into this new one? Was there some roadblocks along the way and what challenges did you have to navigate based off of customers feedback to continuously streamline this ordering process? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of challenges and it's totally different um, creating a website that sells to other businesses versus a website that we would use buying in our personal life that sells to consumers. And so there was a lot of concern about, Oh, what if um, I accidentally ordered something and you guys are going to charge me for it? Or what if um, somebody got access to my account and ordered things on my behalf and that's a risk for my company um and so that's been a huge roadblock and we have really prioritized safety and data integrity and making sure that our customers know exactly what's happening and upper management at their company could know what's happening so there's full transparency um, so one example is that we um, can do like we do email alerts we can set up different levels of accounts so that if somebody just wants to troubleshoot or find the part they're looking for but doesn't have to request quotes or order stuff they can just see they can do like a read-only version um, and we're still developing new ways um, we've recently developed a, a new feature called lists where one person can basically add things to their list and then send it to somebody else in their company. And that person can quote unquote, like approve or confirm that we still want all this stock and then they can do the ordering if that's the way their company organizes um, purchasing. That is, that is so cool. And you, you talked about troubleshooting. I don't think we've highlighted all of the capabilities of shop Vestis. It looks like there's, um, other services that you offer on shop Vestis. Can you walk me through that? Unless I misinterpreted it, but I'm pretty sure it's, um, you know, a, a Swiss army knife of a resource. Can you tell me about the other aspects of shop Vestis in general? Yeah, some other features. Well, we do have one exciting feature that you wouldn't have seen yet, but that's coming out soon. Ooh. And that's going to be um, basically maintenance lists. 
And so if you have ever ordered consumables for one site or for a lot of sites, um, every year it feels like it's a new fresh challenge. Every six months I'm making up, oh yeah, which um, greases did this site use and how many of which turbine type are on this site. And if I'm doing a whole fleet, like I'm a buyer in an office, um, maybe I'm a new self performer and I'm just kind of getting back up to speed on what all the sites need. We're going to have a calculator that will do vest this turbine um, maintenance components, maintenance wow. part. So you can literally pick, I have a V100 that's seven years old. This is maintenance A and it's going to tell you what you need for your 44 turbines or your 106 turbines. Um, and if it comes in cases, it'll, if it comes in cases, it'll like tell you how many cases you need. So you don't like order half a tube of grease on accident and don't order like 20 extra tubes for no reason because people are using tubes on two turbines. So we're like so excited to, to streamline that process and make it really easy. Um, some other features of the website is it has basically a um, copy and paste function from Excel because everybody's using Excel and that's kind of how you keep track of what you want to order. So you can copy and paste your quantities from Excel, add it all to your cart. No reason to be shopping and clicking on different web pages if you already know what you want to order. Wow. And then are there any other future developments outside of maintenance schedules and all these different tools that you put together that you're that you can share with us today? Um, even if it means we have to delay the release of the podcast, I'd like to <laughs> be the first to hear of something. Yeah, there is all kinds of new stuff. I don't want to go too much into detail, but I would say that maybe invoicing is going to have some stuff on the website soon. And this year we rolled out our repairs um, web pages so that now you can shop uh, for repairs for your turbine on the website and see all of our capabilities. And that is a big area that we're trying to grow um, on the website. So right now you have a cool picture description, which turbine types we do, a form that lets you put in all the details like how many turbines and what mark version and all that. But we're going to keep growing that and have even more repair options and more visibility to the customer so that you can keep track of um, your repair project from quoting to invoicing on the website. Oh, that's cool. And these are repairs for major components, small components like a motor. And is this all done in-house by Vestas or is this outsourced to different vendors that you work with across the, the globe? This is stuff that we do, and this is mostly stuff actually at the site that will go install a gearbox or just anything that the customer would rather pay somebody else to do if they're dealing with other projects. Um, we can come in and use our certified vests as technicians to take care of the job for you. Wow. So parts, repair services, predictive maintenance. You can also help them auto order via uh, an Excel spreadsheet. You streamline the ordering process. Um, and then I'm sure there's future developments, like you said, invoicing and other visionary ideas that Vestas is pushing. Um, can you talk about the company as a whole, maybe, and then we can wrap up this conversation? What is the direction that Vestas is going? Obviously, we see the global expansion, um, but internally, what are the discussions? What other facets of the business are you looking to grow? What are the conversations like talking about the, the global footprint, even in crazy areas? I think I saw Iceland or very, very northern, northern parts of the world where they're getting turbines both on and offshore. Could you walk me through just the direction of Vestas over the next, say, 5, 10, 15 years and where you foresee it ending up? Yeah, like you said, I mean, we're trying to be an energy solution globally. So we want to work with other companies. We want to create wind farms and plants that will suit so many different types of situations. And um, a big part of that is separate from Vestas, but is Vestas MHI, offshore turbines in the US is kind of um, kicking up right now. And we, we just keep looking for opportunities. There's always a challenge. Um, the grid's always changing. And every single, the more I talk to my global counterparts, I realize, yeah, we're all selling spare parts but everybody has their own different challenges. Everybody has different types of um, customer needs. 
And so it's been really fun to kind of learn from their issues and also learn from all their gains. That's really neat. You said offshore as well. And I'd be uh, hard pressed to skip over this. Vestas has, I think it's a, what is it? A 9.5 megawatt offshore turbine um, installed in, I think it's Europe. I'm not sure other areas, obviously you probably know better than I do. Um, could you talk about maybe for some of the listeners that are new to wind energy, the difference between onshore and offshore and some of the challenges that come with both um, as best you can? Yeah, I really am not the expert in offshore, but um, it is exciting that the U.S. now has our first offshore wind site in, off the coast of Rhode Island. And I know on the West Coast, we're investigating Santa Monica and new areas to build turbines. And I think the supply chain, I'm a supply chain person, obviously, so I think the supply chain is going to be really interesting. Um, but I've heard really interesting things about cranes, like having a crane boat. How many, you know, like I've heard European countries are kind of, are able to use them, share them a little bit more than in the U.S. We just have so much coastline. And so there's going to be lots of challenges. <laughs> but I, I think that's what makes wind interesting is it's still growing and it's still evolving. I agree 100%. And if you think about offshore winds in just some of the preliminary research that I've done, I mean, you have to somehow get these guys out however many, you know, miles out, a half mile, could be less, could be more, I'm not 100% sure, out to a wind turbine in the middle of the ocean. Somehow they have to get off a boat, unload their parts and their harnesses and their tools, climb up this massive structure. And then what do you do if there's some sort of high waves or high winds coming through? Where do they stay? I think I saw the, um, one of the largest wind turbines, offshore wind turbines from GE is talking about putting in sleeping quarters and kitchen, kitchen quarters. So there's so many fascinating developments within this new technology that's being adopted here in the U.S. I'd be very, very uh, keen to pay attention to what Bestis does and how you guys ultimately tap into that market share as well, which is always very exciting. Yeah, no, it's, it's super, we're going to learn a lot. <laughs> I agree. Chris, so the last question that I like to ask people, um, and you can take this any direction that you want. I actually stole this from Tim Ferriss. Um, I don't know if you know who Tim Ferriss is, author, podcaster, somebody that I like to pay attention to, but he basically asked people and declined to not answer if you don't want to. Um, but if you could have a billboard that the entire world would see, what would you put on it? Hmm. And this one's a curveball. I didn't send over this question to you prior. <laughs> I, think, I think the reason that people get into wind is because we want to help make the world a better place, typically. And we think that doing, creating energy from wind is going to help the world um, avoid some climate change or some other consequences of using fossil fuels. And so maybe just you know, think of others and, and, you know, some kind of motivational message about yeah. like helping the world because that's what most people are striving to do every day. And I love having a reminder of what the big picture is after I've typed in 500 part numbers and my fingers are numb. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to have that sort of um, underlying value and principle of we are working to push change and to ultimately get the globe to adopt renewable energy. So I think that's Fantastic that you were able to tie in the billboard to what you do for a living. Um, and I think your background is just fascinating. Uh, Trisha, how can people get to know you better? How can they interact with Vestas better? Where can people find you? Yeah, I, I would love anybody listening to this to check out Shop Vestas. And I know not everybody is going to have a need for Shop Vestas today, but I did want to drop a little promo. If people watch the podcast and they do the contact us button on Shop Vestas and say you came from the Kurtz podcast. I can send you a little Shop Vestas hat. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and so, do that right now. So the top five, first five people to um, submit a little contact us saying I came from the podcast. We'd love to send you a Shop Vestas hat and you can rep your Vestas gear. Very cool. We'll definitely make sure that we promote that as well and let our um, listeners know if you stay to stay till the end, you get a special surprise from Vestas. There we um, go. And also, Trisha, I'll send people over to the Vestas site in general, the history, the About Us page, your visions that you put together at a, at a corporate level, even all the way down to 
um, you know, people at the site. Everybody seems to live out these ideals and values of pushing to um, further grow wind in the United States and reno renewable energy. And it's just really impressive to interact with people like you, Tricia. So I do appreciate the time. Um, again, if we can, we can have you back on, I'm sure that there's going to be more developments in three, six months, um, just based on how quickly Vestas and wind in general moves. Um, but again, thank you for coming on the show and I'm yeah, super excited to, uh, to have our listeners pay more attention to Vestas, Shop Vestas and what you guys are doing. Great. Yeah. It's been great talking to you. Thank you a bunch. Absolutely. Trisha. Well, I appreciate the time. Awesome. Thank you.